Charles Bronson. You've seen him like this, like this, and like this. But you've never seen Bronson like this, like this, or like this. Now, Charles Bronson. Oh, me. And Jill Ireland. Wowie, yourself. In From Noon Till Three. It's a love story, too good to be true. I hope that wasn't meant to be an insult. Charles Bronson is Graham Dorsey, the outlaw. Your name is now spoken in the same breath as Jesse James. He saw what he wanted. The first law of chivalry is to rescue ladies in distress. And took it. <laughs> she knew what he needed. If you're so depraved, you'd inflict your desires on an unwilling body. Then proceed. <laughs> and gave it. The whole world will remember the love they shared from noon till three. Love isn't something you measure that way. It's a romance. I think I'm in love with you. Me too. I think I'm in love with you. Me too. I think I'm in love with you. Me too. Book One, Genesis, Chapter Five, The Fourth Estate, Part Two. The Freeman Foundation newspaper was a popular idea inside headquarters. I already knew how to cheaply produce a periodical. Acorn Engineering was loaded with photocopiers and Xerox paper and my job description allowed me the run of the place, save for the women's restroom and the old man's office. I was cunning enough to crank out an underground newspaper given these resources, right under the noses of the neck-tied executrons and stuffed shirt vice presidents. The actual writing was not even a consideration. I had enough bile in my brain to print a 10-page daily rant on the State of the Union, and my new friends could be trusted to provide fresh perspectives on the downfall of modern society. And if I needed filler material, I had no qualms about the outright theft of copyrighted works. What starving author could complain? After all, we were trying to save a seed of humanity here. No people meant no royalty checks, didn't it? Lauren struggled mightily to rise from the sofa, flailing at the armrest to gain a handhold, then thought better of the idea and fell back onto the imitation leather firmament. Son of man, God said, pointing either a Polish sausage or an index finger at me, caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. Destruction cometh, and they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. I always wanted my own newspaper, and I had one now. More importantly, I had control, a kingdom never ruled in any of my writing efforts, except perhaps for the satirical treatment I gave the Wizard of Oz back in the fifth grade. Mr. Turner was so taken by the script he assigned me to direct my classmates in a theatrical production of my opus to entertain an evening PTA meeting. That night I was a ten-year-old Orson Welles, but after Final Curtain never got to acknowledge my mother's shouts of author because my stagehands mortally damaged a mock fireplace, the only prop Baker School owned. The fake hearth was shattered during a frantic scene change after Dorothy's mother allowed Toto to be seized by government edict. Let them take Toto, Dorothy. I'm sick and tired of cleaning up his messes. So I was backstage explaining the prop destruction to an irate janitor while my parents stood on metal folding chairs in the school's cafeteria auditorium applauding wildly and urging a curtain call. Author! Author! Twenty-five years later, the literal and figurative janitor crushing my creative spirit was an idiot Baptist with no appreciation for irreverence. Dwayne Hoover, acorn sales manager and heretofore described asshole, was religiously devout yet saw no sin in raping and pillaging my inspired pipeline copy. I tolerated Hoover only because I was expecting a telephone call from the New York or Chicago Times. Editors no doubt eager to verify my home address for the first class plane ticket I would need to swoop in and boost their sagging circulation with my poignant, insightful prose. Plus, a perk the pipeline feature writer enjoyed was the ability to sit on his ass and stare at walls for, in my case, $13.74 an hour. I spent that time in Acorn's upstairs lunchroom, armored beneath my press shield, imagining outrageous copy and sporting attempts at dodging Hoover's editing acts. Could he catch all of the craziness? Usually not. Each pipeline issue became a tribute to Dwayne Hoover's ineptitude. I once wrote an employee profile of an Acorn veteran named Mary Claire. I like Mary. She had been helpful to me as a new hire, so I played the story respectfully straight. 
Hoover, ever vigilant, called me in on his carpet after I filed a story. How can you insult Mary like this? He demanded. I was struck dumb by his glowering accusation. You can't call someone a fixture at Acorn, he shouted. It was then all I could do to keep a straight face. Hoover had equated fixture with plumbing fixture, like the commode commodity Acorn was mass producing in the factory below our feet. I pulled Noah Webster's ninth out of his office bookcase and suggested he read the definition. In Dwayne Hoover's curious mind, I had called Mary Claire a toilet. I spent a lot of time praying for another kind of deliverance in the serenity of that upstairs lunchroom. Madeline Blue's desk was in close proximity, so there was always the chance she might wander in to drop coins into the snack vending machine, allowing me the opportunity to articulate something suave and debonair like, Snickers bar, eh? I had a girlfriend once who'd do anything for chocolate. Does the same thing work on you? If polite giggles were orgasms, Madeline and I would have a half dozen kids by now. My pursuit of this woman was maddening. All this unrequited lust was making my head hurt. I carried her image everywhere I went, which lately wasn't too many places, since my anxiety had effectively grounded me. It was becoming increasingly difficult to perform the most trivial of tasks. Even grocery shopping was torturous. So Madeline's indifference to my overtures was perhaps a godsend considering dinner, a movie, and a trip to the emergency room was probably the only way I could have shown her a good time. I assuaged my frustration by convincing myself I was simply a hard enough man to know, let alone understand, and immersing myself in nightly marathons of writing with the liquor-fueled faith my presumed talent would take me away from this place, away from my redneck boss, the witless Dwayne Hoover, these yuppie executrons and vapid vice presidents, far, far away from the third world chaos of Southern California. I would be going and not stopping for shit. Alpha Centauri or bust. But for now, I was marooned in the earthbound publishing business. Tom had a story idea for the first issue of The New Truth, and when Tom Chappell claimed the floor, he also confiscated the walls and ceiling. I squeezed in on the sofa alongside God for the monologue. The biggest advantage this government has is the ignorance of the people, Tom began. Space programs are so high-tech most people can't understand them. But there's one thing everybody understands. John Kennedy said we're going to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And we did it, okay? There's no excuse why we can't keep doing it. We decided to do something, we did it, it worked, and now we decide we're going to do something and only spend money not doing it. Even when we do do it, it doesn't work. We waste billions launching blind telescopes. We send the shuttle up at a billion dollars per launch and it doesn't go anywhere. It just takes the long way from Florida to California. Watching Tom emote, I felt like the chair umpire during play of an interminable point in a Stefan Edberg Mats Wielander tennis match on the slow grass courts of Wimbledon. Lauren was ignoring Tom's pacing vituperation, focusing instead on a Hustler magazine story entitled Alien Sex Crimes Inside the Extraterrestrial Breeding Program. Tom was oblivious to God's inattention, blinded by his own invective that worked him into this frenzied state, hastening his back and forth stride. In Tom Chappell's eyes, America's space shuttle was a symbol of the monetary excess and visionless national space policy that left us essentially landlocked. He loved to hate that damn space shuttle. The shuttle was originally sold to taxpayers at $500 a pound in low Earth orbit. The net payload cost today is $30,000 a pound, and climbing, Tom railed. It was also sold on the premise its failure rate would be 1 in 1,000. The Delta is the most reliable booster we've ever built, and its failure rate is 1 in 100. How could something as complicated as the shuttle have a failure rate of 1 in 1,000? Tom froze momentarily and glared at me. How could you even believe that, he accused, and for some odd reason, I briefly felt the doomed challenger had been my responsibility. I gave Tom a shoulder shrug, but his was a rhetorical question. I couldn't have responded even if I wanted to. Tom was lost in the ozone of his soaring diatribe. Industry experts calculated the actual shuttle failure rate at 1 in 35. It failed on the 25th launch, so they already knew the shuttle was unreliable. I had recently read the U.S. Congressional Report on the Challenger disaster and deftly offered Tom the benefit of my coincidental research. Hell, NASA was told before the launch there was a problem. The shuttle, even today, is loaded with potential failures, Tom replied, his hands politely waving off my interruption. Yes, they ignored the seals on the booster's O-rings in 86, but there's 300 systems on that vehicle that can fail just as catastrophically. 
one major failure of a turbo pump valve and the whole thing blows again. Um, they know this. Von Braun had told them. Werner Von Braun told them what they were doing with the shuttle was idiotic. A team designing the original concept considered several configurations and concluded solid rocket boosters would make the shuttle non-man rateable. That ended up being the very thing that failed. NASA was told that. No official reports were ever published, but I know it's been set off the record. Ignoring that warning, I consider the big wigs at NASA, including Dan Golden, as far as I am concerned, are guilty of murder, I howled. Welcome, Dana. Murder one, seven counts. Of negligent homicide, Tom said, reducing my indictment to the lesser charge. Undeterred by my intrusion, Tom pressed his denunciation onward. NASA was fully aware people were going to die that day. There was an engineer named McDonald who supervised Morton Thiokol's solid rocket booster testing. McDonald was supposed to sign off on the major contractor checklist for the launch, but uh, he refused to sign off because his data indicated the lowest temperature the boosters would reliably work was 53 degrees, and it was 17 degrees below freezing at the Cape. McDonald knew the O-ring seals would not hold at that temp, but he was overridden by Thiokol management and NASA. Now, although Mr. McDonald seems heroic, there's one other thing he could have done. He would have lost his job, but he could have called the Cape directly and explained his position. Mr. McDonald didn't do that, and for that reason I think he was an absolute total first class wimp. He covered his ass by refusing to sign off, but he still let those people die. He could have just said, to hell with my job, I think people's lives are more important. Later, after the investigation, McDonald was completely exonerated, but the question was put to him by the media, why didn't you stop it? If I was in his position, I myself personally, I would have flown to the Cape, rented a car, and parked it underneath the shuttle main engine and said, you will not fire this thing. I will sit here and you will not fire. I would have gone that far. I could care less about a lousy job. I can't kill people to keep a lousy job. I'm a risk taker, but I believe in taking calculated, intelligent risks. You don't do things that are just blatantly stupid, but to do space travel, K, okay, you need to take risks. If you take too many of the wrong kinds of risks, you'll stop taking any risks. Had this thing blown up from a completely undetectable, unforeseeable event, hit by lightning, uh, ran into a flock of birds, things that happen every day to airliners, no big deal, shit happens. But because it was a known design flaw and flown knowingly with its failure rate, they completely destroyed any possibility of taking risks in the future. NASA doesn't take any risks now. They don't take risks they could take, that they should take. That's unfortunate, because once you stop taking risks, your space program is dead. This is what's killed our space program.